And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Tuesday's midterm election is shaping up to be historic for Republicans on the state level, and the results could impact the country's political landscape for years to come as states prepare to redraw congressional districts for the first time in a decade. Republicans won more than 600 state legislative races and took control of at least 19 legislative chambers across the country. In addition, Republicans won 21 governor's seats, with Democrats grabbing eight. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, the Republicans now hold more state legislative seats than at any time since 1928. In North Carolina and Alabama, Republicans controlled the legislature for the first time since Reconstruction. In Minnesota, they controlled the state Senate for the first time ever. And in the key swing state of Ohio, Republican John Kasich ousted Democratic Governor Ted Strickland, and re Republicans seized Ohio's lower house. And the closely watched governor's race in Vermont has been decided. Uh, Democrat Peter Shumlin claimed victory after Republican Brian Doobie conceded the race. These gains by Republicans will have a big impact when state lawmakers begin to decide how to withdraw the district boundaries for the House of Representatives. To talk more about this, we're joined by Michael McDonald, associate professor at George Mason University. McDonald has written extensively on the redistricting process and has worked as an advisor to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. He also helps run the Public Mapping Project website. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Michael McDonald. Uh, explain what redistricting is, how significant it is, and what these uh, new uh, elections mean. Yeah, well, periodically we redraw our district boundaries, and this is ostensibly to equalize population. This is a requirement that's in necessary, essentially the federal con constitution. Um, and I say ostensibly because what really goes on is that the boundary lines are manipulated to either help political parties or particular incumbents um, win their elections. And so, although we had an election um, this last uh, uh, a couple days ago, um, much of what uh, goes on behind the scenes in determining where these district boundary lines are drawn um, really has a, a great influence on the choices that are presented to the public and who is likely um, to win in a particular um, uh, area, a state, or district. And so the redistricting has just a huge influence over the entire course of the decade um, as to who is going to be likely to be running for the uh, different districts and, and represent you across the country. Now, in, in previous redistricting efforts, there have been huge battles that have erupted. I remember after the 1990 uh, census, there was uh, uh, many battles over the question of the, the Supreme Court actually having to rule on the creation of majority-minority districts. And then in uh, after 2000, you had the big uh, battle in Texas over the many of the congressional districts that were redrawn by Republicans that were uh, aimed at really removing uh, uh, many uh, Democrats from uh, being able to get into Congress. What do you envision will happen, uh, the major battlegrounds that will occur this time around? Well, uh, the losers of redistricting often go to court, and so it, the political parties understand that this is very important. So they put a lot of resources into this. They will um, do a lot during the redistricting process, and then if, if they don't uh, get district lines that are favorable to them, they're going to go to court. So this is just kind of a natural landscape that we've seen since the 1960s, since the courts be, uh, really got involved in redistricting. Um, and so this time around, uh, we, we will probably see more litigation. Um, because it's just the way that things happen here, and both parties are gearing up uh, um, fundraising machines to uh, to ensure that they will have the resources to do litigation. And if we look across the states, uh, um, we are likely to see litigation related to the Voting Rights Act, uh, because uh, there's been a bit of uncertainty uh, with some rulings over the past decade and a reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2007. Um, the states are going to want to test out uh, um, what the limits are of uh, of racial gerrymandering, and um, um, so uh, very likely we'll see some sort of court action there. Uh, we'll likely also see um, uh, states try and um, uh, change the definition of, uh, of population, and this is very important because districts have to be of equal population. But there's a little bit of wiggle room here. Some states have, for example, are redistributing um, felon populations uh, out to 
from where they are currently residing in prisons to other areas of the state, that's likely to be litigated. So places like Maryland and, and New York, among others, are, are states that have passed that law. Um, and other um, states are going to be looking at uh, potentially also changing the base of, of population, maybe to citizens. And so I, I foresee some litigation uh, along that line. And then um, finally, what in a state like Florida, um, just passed an initiative uh, by a voter uh, referendum, um, and it was really amazing that they did so because they needed 60 percent of the vote to do it. And that initiative sets a, a list of state criteria for drawing redistricting. So there's some federal criteria about equal population and the Voting Rights Act. Then there's some state criteria. And what we've seen is over since the 1990s, um, a proliferation of, um, of, of the state criteria and lawsuits that are um, really aimed at uh, making districts comply with these state criteria. And so I see like a state like Florida in particular, um, because the, the stakes are going to be so high in that battleground state, and Republicans won so many seats down there um, that the Democrats are likely going to be challenging whatever the um, state government does on redistricting uh, with this new uh, set of, of criteria. And, and you're going to see much similar sorts of things elsewhere. But I would say that in congressional redistricting, usually states have a free reign to do whatever they want to do. It's more in state legislative redistricting that we see criteria being applied by states in addition to the federal criteria. So there are only a few other opportunities for um, state uh, lawsuits about state criteria in other states. And Michael McDonald, of course, the the, the main uh, demographic trend in the United States now for for uh, I guess uh, several decades now has been the increasing growth of population in the Southwest and the West vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, the shrinking percentage of the population in the in the East and the Northeast, and obviously the Southwestern states will gain uh, will gain uh, and the Western states will gain congressional seats while they will be taking them from the East and the Northeast, and it's precisely in the Southwest, where you've had this huge explosion of the Latino population in the country. So how do you see this, uh, the issue of uh, racial gerrymandering affecting what happens in places like Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, California, and Texas? Well, Texas and Arizona and parts of California are covered under what's called Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And Section 5 says that these jurisdictions, not all, just some, um, and it includes the three I just listed, um, they cannot diminish the opportunity for minorities to elect candidates of their choice. So the, the number of minority districts that currently exist in those, in those states, you have to keep that number. Uh, in the next redistricting. So that's Section 5 is a very important part of the of what's going to be happening over the the, um, the next year or so with redistricting. And that, Another that very important. Mean, and that would mean that the Justice Department has to pre-clear any redistricting that, this, that the states decide on? Yeah, the procedure is that a state will draw a redistricting plan, and then the Department of Justice or District Court of D.C. will then um, clear that or pre-clear that map for use. And so... Um, that's, that's, that's the components under Section 5, which are very important, and they also apply to other southern jurisdictions, um, for, mainly for African-American um, voting rights concerns, but also because of gr growing Latino populations in states like uh, Florida, it, it, they also apply um, uh, to Latino populations there. Uh, so Section 5 is very important, but I, I do want to mention Section 2, which is, applies everywhere in the country. And Section 2, there are three criteria. One is that the minority population is large enough to draw a district around, that the minority population is drawing it, it votes for candidates of their choice, and the white population votes for candidates that are not the minority favored candidates. And if you have those three conditions in place, then the Voting Rights Act says you must you must draw a um, district to uh, help uh, minorities elect a candidate of their choice. So in a state like Texas, where the Latino population has grown considerably, first under Section 5, they are going to have to draw at least the same number of, of minority districts as they currently have. And then, in addition to that, they may, under Section 2, have to draw additional districts. And we're just going to have to monitor this. We won't know until the Census Bureau begins releasing population data in February of next year um, whether or not these uh, Latino populations are large enough to draw these districts around. And if they are, and if these other conditions about voting exist, then you must draw a Latino district. Michael McDonald, can you also talk about the redistricting reform ballot measures approved Tuesday by voters in California and in Minnesota? 
Um, well, in uh, in uh, California, we in 2008 we had a an initiative that was um, a, a adopted by the voters that applied to the state legislature. And that uh, in 2010, there were two initiatives on the ballot. One would undo that initiative. That one failed spectacularly. And then there was another one that would extend the um, commission's responsibilities to congressional redistricting. And uh, so that one uh, passed overwhelmingly as well. So now, um, although the Democrats gained um, uh, uh, control of the state government in California, they did not gain control of the redistricting process there, which is very important because when you look across the landscape, that was 53 or 54 um, districts that were taken off the table for um, the Democrats to gerrymander, and you're going to see many other gerrymanders going on uh, by Republicans in states like Florida and Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan, these large battleground states that uh, um, where Republicans have unified control. Now, I hate to say I'm not very familiar voters with what in happened Minneapolis in approved, Voters in Minneapolis approved a referendum that removes political parties from the redistricting process. Process. Uh, all right, so it's a, a local initiative, and um, yeah, there, there, there's been a move um, uh, to, to adopt commissions. Uh, California is a good example of this, and uh, the, that initiative, similar initiative, has been in the ballot elsewhere. Um, so uh, it, it sounds good to me, <laughs> I, I, because of there's a real potential here for self abuse of, uh, of politicians drawing um, districts for themselves, and uh, they will cut off, cut, cut out their um, opposition. So they uh, so political uh, parties yeah. will not be allowed to choose people to the redistricting commission. It will be a judge that does it. Yeah, and that's interesting because uh, um, each state has their own way of doing this. So California has a citizen commission where citizens apply to be a part of the commission. They're vetted, and, and there's a, a very complex selection procedure there. Um, what Minnesota uh, and I've worked with reformers in Minnesota uh, on, at the state level on reforms, and what Minnesota Minnesotans like is they they like their judges. They um, have a tradition of um, of respect for their judiciary and. And uh, so you get, you know, different states look at their own political culture. In California, they want citizens to do redistricting or at least be responsible for it. In Minnesota, there's more trust and faith put into judges. Michael McDonald, we want to thank you very much for being with us, redistricting expert at George Mason University in Virginia. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. Very close race uh, uh, in Tucson. We're going to be speaking with the co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, who appears to have survived his challenge, but the final numbers are not in that. Ra Raul Grajalva will join us next. Stay with us.